So, hi everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, one more session of the course Design, Technology and Innovation. So, today I'm a little bit unwell. Uh, I've been down with the flu. So, I will be speaking a bit slowly and uh, I may need to take like short breaks in between. But um, let's wait for a few minutes first for a few more people to join in. Since I think, um, you know, there's people who join in a little bit late. So let's just give it a few minutes and um, then we'll get started.
Okay, so let's uh, let's start with today's um, class. Um, so before I jump into the week three content, let me first go into the assignment for the previous week. And since I mean we cannot discuss this week's assignment because it's still due for submission and due date is not over yet. So. <coughs> We can't discuss this week's assignment, but we can discuss the previous week's assignment for which the solutions are now available on the platform. And uh, we can discuss that. We can discuss any questions you might have and uh, um, any other issues you have from previous week's content also. So let me share the page. Please open, um, since if all of you were logged in, uh, please open the Swayam portal and uh, go to the uh, assignment for week two, which is status as quiz for week two. <coughs> Just give me a moment. I'm sharing this screen. Okay. So <clears throat> this is the week two segment. And uh, um, now they have actually updated the portal with the link to the live sessions also. So if you see here at the bottom, problem solving session, July 2023. So this is the link to um, all the uh, you know the links of all the videos which we will be uploading from the live session. So we are recording all of these live sessions and uh, we are uploading them to YouTube and you can see all of these videos on YouTube. And uh, these links are available on this page. So if you click on this page, it will take you to a spreadsheet. And uh, there you can actually see all the videos as they get uploaded. And you can also see the shared folder. So I think some of you have not found that. Some of you are saying that you don't have access to the shared material because I uploaded the slides um, for the week two, um, you know, the handout and the practice problem set and for week one and week two. Uh, and uh, I think uh, many people have not been able to access it. So. It's just housekeeping stuff, but you know you you do need to just click this link, and there you will see the shared folder for the entire course, and inside that, week by week, I have uploaded the the slides. So please check that, and uh, please uh, uh, make sure that you are able to download it because if you have any issue finding the link or with downloading the files. Please let me know. So I'll just give you a few minutes to open the link and check at least the people who are on the call. If you can just open the link and just check that you are in fact able to download the files and see the video. So videos where I have uploaded these ones, the uh, you know the last uh, lectures, whatever those same that same channel is where the <coughs> next few videos for the remaining modules will also be. So I'm just giving you a minute to check that. If you have any trouble, please tell me. You can mute yourself and speak, or you can also just... Uh, Message me in the chat box. Is it saying something? Okay, you see the link now. Okay.
Okay, so I think now <clears throat> uh, people are kind of comfortable. All right, so we can start. I just wanted everybody to uh, have access to everything now uploaded. So that's kind of why I wanted to give this a few minutes because last week people were complaining that <clears throat> they're not able to see where the videos are getting uploaded. So you can also just bookmark the YouTube channel um, because all the future videos are also going to be uploaded to the same channel. So this, if you when you if you don't want to go to the link on the platform every time, the spreadsheet, I mean, you can also just directly see the videos as they get uploaded on the YouTube channel. Okay, so this is week two. Uh, now what I'm discussing, it's week two assignment. You can see the shared screen. All right. So the first question is, of course, very straightforward. What is the full form? NCPRE. Now in, um, in week two, we are discussing photovoltaic cells. This is a solar, small solar panel. So this is not going to be something to do with people rehabilitation and people and rural entrepreneurship and all that. It's going to be something to do with photovoltaic and uh, what they are doing in that uh, entire project, that entire, uh, you know, yeah, in that entire thing, as we'll see later, it has more to do with education rather than energy. So this is, if, even if you don't remember the full form, like, if you've not, if you've not sort of wrote, learned the full form, you can still figure out what the full form of NCPRE is if you just know, um, if you just remember what the exact project was and uh, what they were doing in that uh, <coughs> project. So for questions like these, I mean, it maybe your memory is not very good in terms of remembering things were back in like that it happens to many people but um <coughs> try to logically reason and use like you know something like a process of elimination so uh, all of these answers look very very feasible like they could all be correct but uh, at the end of the day only one is correct so if you don't remember this is basically a factual question it's not a very deep question but if you don't remember the full form of NCPRE, by the end of the entire course, you may forget. That's very much possible. So in if that happens, if that is the case, you can, <coughs> you can just <coughs> you can just reason it out as to what is most likely. Since the project is about photovoltaic cells, it is probably going to be something to do with photovoltaic research. And since the project has to do with um, you know, education of kids, mostly kids actually, then it would there should be something to do with education and the need. So option number A is the correct answer. Okay, let's go to Second question, uh, what is the percentage of global population not having access to clean cooking, according to Professor Chetan Solanki? So Professor Solanki has given a whole lot of very interesting statistics in the uh, beginning of the course. And this is one of them, that clean cooking is one of the big challenges of people in the rural areas. And uh, you know, there's... Uh, this we have to keep in mind that this figure, this percentage, is not the current figure. That is the main thing I wanted to point out in this particular question. I'll just give you the current figure. Let me just give you the current figure.
Okay, interestingly, <clears throat> the current figure is also 40%, but the number is more. So it is still 40%, but the number is approximately 3 uh, billion. So just give me a moment, I'll show you this place where uh, they actually have a really good um, data for this thing. So some of the uh, statistics say that the number of people globally without clean cooking fell from 3 billion in 2010 to 2.3 billion in 2022. That's the that's kind of what I also believed. Uh, yeah, sorry, what I initially said was a bit wrong. My gut instinct was right. Mm. So this uh, is a good database, but it is a bit dated. It's a bit out of date. Let me share this too. So this is from the IEA now, what I'm showing you. This is uh, access to clean cooking data from IEA. And uh, <clears throat> according to them, the number in 2022, which is last year, was 2.3 billion people worldwide who still do not have access to clean cooking. Uh, and they rely on traditional use like, you know, biomass, kerosene, coal, etc. And these are the main, you know, culprits when it comes to emissions and, you know, indoor air pollution. So the rest of it is, of course, um, you know, much more detailed in discussion where this is the map I wanted to show you where you can see how let's rewind it you can see how the map is changing basically how many people do not have access to clean cooking so in 2009 34 percent people <coughs> did not have access to clean cooking 2014 45 percent 45.5, 5, 5, 17, 55.5, 5, 20, 21, 68.1, in 2022, 68.4% in India <coughs> do not have access to clean cooking. Sorry, sorry, it's the other way around. Share of population with access to clean cookings. That's what I was wondering, how come it's increasing? So 68.4, currently it is 68.4% of the population which has access to clean cooking. And um, you can see that the ones which have dark green are kind of, uh, you know, on the higher side. And there are many countries like in Africa especially, which have very low access, only like 1% of the population has access to alternate um, sources of energy for cooking. You can see which countries do well, which countries aren't doing well. All right, so this is just for your knowledge sake, so you understand where we stand on this. And I wanted to just show you this thing, this uh, website, that the, the that statistic is a bit dated, 
I don't know in percentage terms what the percentage is right now, but uh, up to the last statistic, which was taken in 2019 or something, it was 3 billion people who did not have access to clean cooking, which totaled to 40% of the global population at that point of time. But the last latest one from 2022 is uh, 2.3 billion. And I, I don't know what it is in the percentage terms, but it is less than 40%. And this is the page where you can see uh, that compilation of uh, data on access to clean cooking. Um, this is also an interesting website where you get a whole lot of such data. So, um, as per this particular news report, uh, it says that uh, number of people globally without clean cooking fell from 3 billion to 2.3 billion. But China, India, and Indonesia have halved their populations without clean cooking. Access. And these relied largely on free stoves, subsidies, canisters of liquefied petroleum gas, LPG. So, <clears throat> this is, um, like if you remember, there was a scheme by the Indian government, which started, I think, in 2014 or something, to check, um, you know, indoor air pollution and stuff. So, they distributed LPG cylinders and all to rural areas, people in rural areas, and they voluntarily offered people in, you know, the cities and people who could afford a gas cylinder to give up their LPG subsidy. So if you, so the subsidy was cancelled, you needed to kind of opt in if you wanted the subsidy. So and this is just a little bit of a side track. Maybe I derailed a little bit, but I just thought it interesting to see how this particular statistic of 40% has changed since this course was created because this original the lecture videos were recorded um, some time ago and uh, you know we have the world has changed a bit since this this lecture was uh, created <clears throat> okay question number three why was localization important in the case of the soul project so the whole project by professor solan key and his team, where uh, we'll come to what they do in the project, but this whole project was called SOUL, and it's important to remember the full form of SOUL also, um, which is uh, sort of, you think of it as a sort of a mnemonic, but you know, you should know the full form of SOUL also. Um, what was the reason that localization was important in the SOUL project? And uh, there are multiple options. First is low cost of transportation. Second is people can communicate as they know better what they want. Uh, third is employability of the local community. Fourth is easy repair and maintenance. Now, um, the first is a very, very important actually, because in um, this whole soul project, if you remember, he actually explains that a lot of times, you know, the cost of the product is, uh, you know, like it is, there is a certain cost to the product itself. And then there is a very big chunk of the cost, which comes from just transportation of, of the uh, product. Because a lot of times these products do not reach uh, people in villages in remote areas especially and these people the people in remote areas like you know if you have a really nice solution like a like a uh, reading light which is very cost effective which is uh, you know which is very easy to use for example uh, the right user for that is going to be people in the rural areas right it's, it's going to, of course, it's going to help you and me also, but it's going to help people in the rural areas a whole lot more. 
because their need is much greater. Like we do have other options of light to use if we want to, but these people in the rural areas they do not have that option. So uh, the cost of transport is so prohibitive sometimes that the products never even reach the people in the rural areas. It's not that it's not just that they increase the cost, but at some point the cost becomes so prohibitive if you add the transportation cost that it's possible that the products never even reach the areas. And this is kind of like a challenge which they um, they have to work with. That is why when you localize the project, like, you know, when you make the project, uh, when you make a product sort of more easily available locally by manufacturing uh, in rural areas, then it's much, much easier to reduce the cost of transportation because transportation is not much. You know, like it's only over a short distance or maybe sometimes not even that. If it was like just outside the village, the cost of transportation is kind of negligible. And uh, it is uh, one of the reasons why you are able to reduce the entire overall cost of production and transportation of the the product. So the second uh, may be what uh, you know what they want is what they are communicating, but that you can take as user feedback uh, anyway when you're designing, creating a product for them. For that, you don't need to localize the pro entire project itself. That's the point I wanted to make because I think some people were asking uh, that you know people can communicate as they know better what they want is a, one of the reasons why is it not in the answer. So the reason is that the reason why the project was localized was um, uh, not this. Like the communication aspect does come into the project and he discusses that sort of a bit uh, late, later in the lectures. It's there in the lectures, but he discusses it a little bit later in the lectures. And uh, I'll come to that. Why, where, at, in what part of that entire, you know, the product cycle, in what part of it the communication aspect is important. But the aspect we're discussing right now is just that the users are able to tell you what they want in a product, what their requirements are. And that is not necessarily a reason to localize a product because um, people can tell you what they want even if your project, like, you know, manufacturing site and distribution centers are located somewhere else. In the design phase, you will generally talk to the users and uh, you will talk to them even if your project is located somewhere else, right? That's the point I wanted to make. That is why option number two is not, is not included in the correct options. <clears throat> the third employability of the local community. This is actually a very, very important point. And uh, uh, you know, this was one of the key reasons for the success of this whole project, not just key reasons for localization, but the reason why the whole project was so, so astoundingly successful <coughs> was because it was um, taking care of the local economies. If you see Professor Solanki talks about the local economy many times. And what he means by the local economy is that by, lo <laughs> by localizing the project, what he has done is he has involved the community in the entire production process. He gives them training and the product itself is such that it does not require a whole lot of training. It's not like it's, they made it such that the design itself is such that it does not uh, require uh, extensive training, it does not require like, you know, one year of training or something. People can be trained very quickly and putting all the different materials, different parts together and <coughs> and that is kind of how they find it easy to employ the local community because if there was a very big training period 
if the training itself was too difficult and if like you know you needed to learn a whole lot of things uh, in a very lengthy period of time then it would become very difficult for them to employ people because not everybody can be trained for a year they wouldn't have the resources the training cost themselves would become explosive like out of bounds right so that is the reason why employability it's not just employing but you know employability of the local community has to be considered that the product was designed in such a way that they could localize it and they could train people in a very short time to assemble the product to um, you know package and test the product before before you release the product in the market it has to be tested it has to be packaged and you know to sell the product because it was the local people who were involved in even the selling part you know because when you're selling it you need to know um, the features of the product you need to know what is really um, the great thing about it why should people buy it you should be able to make people spend their money open their wallets and that you can do <clears throat> if you are a local person who understands the product and that is where the communication part actually came in that the people who are selling the product were able to speak to the locals in their own language and that is kind of a a bigger win which is not the same thing as point number 2 so when the local people like learned about the product and they were able to explain features of the product to potential buyers in a way that potential buyers would find it um, you know attractive then they can be actually an asset to the whole project and that is why they were far more employable so you see employability of the local community was one of the core reasons for the success of the product so, so the way they designed the product was not just to address the need of the user alone but to address the need of that entire community <laughs> that entire socio economic setup so they address the needs of that entire socio economic setup right is that is that making sense what i'm saying what they did was that they made sure that the local people can be employed so a lot of times people have the vision that it should employ people and it should you know give a boost to the local economy but the, when you actually go to implement it what happens is that <clears throat> the people you want to employ are not ready for it they need a lot of training they need a lot of support before they can uh, actually be employed and those training costs are sort of too high they they don't justify local employment sometimes so then it again becomes a question of you know hiring labor from outside like many of these factories and things that require some specialized understanding some skilled labor but this is not manufactured in a factory like that this is just manufactured in local centers where a lot of them are women where people after some basic training just know how to connect the different parts and how to assemble the <coughs> final lamp okay so going to the next option easy repair and maintenance and this was also one of the you know main reasons for the success of the lamp in the first place because if you see the reasons why he goes over this in the first part of the lecture of the solar peak so you see there were solar lamps available in the market even before they came up with this design if there were there were lamps available in the market the main problems with those lamps was that firstly they were very expensive so the cost was somewhere between i think 
500 to 1200 rupees or something like that right so the lamps by themselves were first of all expensive and then the the second problem was that the design of the lamps available in the market kept changing so you see you go and you buy a lamp in the shop or on amazon and uh, you like it but somehow for some reason it breaks and then what do you want you want it to have it repaired but when you go back to the person from whom you bought it or you go back and check on amazon there is no way to repair the lamp because that design has kind of gone out of the market is no longer being made it has been replaced by some other brand some other design and even if it is uh, you know still available in the market there is no option for you to get it repaired and this is i'm talking about you sitting in the city for people in rural areas even if there is an option to have say a solar lamp repaired that option may be 200 kilometers away from them so the closest you know servicing center or repair center may be so far away that eventually economically it may be actually easier for them to just buy a new lamp and you can buy a new lamp once twice but how many times are you going to buy a new lamp especially when you don't have so much of money to spare on something like a lamp you'd rather buy it two three square meals for your family right so because there was no continued support for report and maintenance uh, sorry for repair and maintenance of the lamps which were available in the market none of these solar lamps available in the market could be used as a solution for this particular problem where the what was the problem the problem was that uh, many of these students living in <clears throat> remote areas in the villages in the rural areas they don't have power at night for many hours and they need to do a lot of their studying at night and for that they need light they can't sit under the street light and study all the time so they wanted to give a reading light to all these uh, children and um, they decided that the only purpose for which they will optimize the design of the lamp will be for reading not for anything else because they can't pack too many features into it otherwise it will become too complicated or too expensive or you know, too difficult to uh, assemble locally so a lot of things will fall apart if they try to sort of pack too much into the design so they uh, that is why they decided that they will optimize the design for just the reading like okay so <clears throat> coming back so that was the problem i i didn't know if there is a question on that or not so i just wanted to make sure that we know what the problem is first and then um easy repair and maintenance was one of the reasons why people were not already using a solar lamp the main question was if there are solar lamps available in the market why are these people not using them what is the issue with using solar lamps and this was the issue that the lamps sort of already in the market were not repairable if they break or if there is some um some sort of an issue then the lamps were just had to be discarded they could not actually use the lamps again and that was like a you know waste of money for them so even if they just see the lamp breaking and not getting repaired you know if somebody says suppose buys it and they see other people see them using the lamp and then they see that you know they spend like 300 rupees say on a lamp so firstly it was not available for 300 rupees but if you buy a lamp for say even 550 rupees and you see that it breaks or it stops working properly after 6 months it's highly unlikely that you will spend 550 rupees yourself 
on such a lamp, right? It's common sense. That's how we all take informed decisions. So easy repair and maintenance was an important factor in the success of the lamp. And for enabling that, localization was important. So if the, if the project was not localized, you would not be able to solve the problem of accessibility to repair and maintenance. Like you can repair and maintain the lamp in other places also, but in the place where the lamp is being used, which is in the local areas, in the local village, they would still not have access. Like they were not, they were not, they're not going to travel 50 kilometers also to have the lamp repaired. It's not worth the money for them. It's too much of a hassle. They have to, even if they say, suppose take a bus or something, or they go on a bullock cart, like, just imagine how much time, how much effort it takes. That's like one day of work for them, right? You can earn money working for one day if you would spend that much time on it. So, you think in those terms, since enabling easy repair and maintenance was one of the design requirements for the product to be successful, that was also not possible unless you actually localize the entire so localization was important in this whole project for this reason also. So I spent a little bit of extra time on this question. And that's mainly because it's a very important question and it covers you know, some important parts of uh, um, this whole project itself. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let's go to question number four. So I'll... I think we've been going on for a bit of time. So just give me a few minutes. I'll just take a short break here and I'll we'll continue in five minutes.
Okay, let's continue. <clears throat> Question number four. Localizing the solution according to Professor Chetan Solanki means option one, making the technology locally available in the most remote areas, local community involved in each and every operation of the solution, uh, third, local involvement of students in promoting the product, fourth is understand local needs to solve a non local problem. Now, uh, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this because I just explained localization in the previous uh, question. So, uh, basically, all of the other options, you can see the correct answer in the on this website. All the other options don't necessarily mean localization. Localization, uh, you know, is generally used I mean, you could use it in, in a grammatical way or in a, you know, from English language point of view, you could use it in many ways. But from an industrial uh, point of view, we say localization when we are producing locally, you know, and when we are involving the local community in the production process also, not just in the, you know, not just in the distribution process and not just in the, you know, promotion of the product or something like that, but where we are actually involving the local community in all the stages of the product life cycle, including production. So if the product is being produced locally also, and the local community is produced locally, means the local community is involved in that, in that part, then we can actually say that it is localized solution itself is localized like where the so the second option where local community is involved in each and every step of the solution is the correct answer okay that's number five how did the students pay only 120 rupees for the solar lamps where the actual price is 500. Mm. So now um, the options are because the design of the lamp includes cheap and recycled materials. Second is because it eliminates the middleman. Third is because it is subsidized by government and philanthropist partners. Fourth is because it is locally manufactured. Now all the options in this question seem very, very feasible. Like they look like they could almost be correct and see the thing is that all of these were uh, steps used to reduce the cost of manufacturing that is the main point I wanted to explain here because I think some people might be confused as to why these are not the correct answer uh, <coughs> the materials they used were of course designed to reduce the cost of manufacturing uh, and they eliminated the middleman. That is also true. So uh, the people who were sort of you employed or not employed, but who were involved in just you know distributing the lamp to the remote areas of the villages, they were eliminated because the production process itself became local. So uh, you know the middleman was no longer required. So they obviously reduced that cost also. And you see, it was manufactured locally. So a lot of the materials were also local. The labor was also local. So they saved on a whole lot of costs there as well. So they saved on costs in many of these ways. But the cost of the lamp was still 500 rupees. Right? The, the actual price of the lamp was still not so less. It was still 500 rupees, even after all these cost reductions. So the real question is that when the lamp itself was 500 rupees um, actual price, then how the hell did the students who for whom the lamp was made, how were they able to buy it for 120 rupees then? That is the question. The question is not how did they bring the cost down to 500 rupees. The question is, if the actual price is 500 rupees, then why were the students paying only 120 rupees for the lamp? How were we able to achieve that? And the answer for that is that the product was heavily subsidized by the government and by other philanthropist partners. So 
so the the lamp was not free for the students because they wanted the students to value it they wanted them to feel like they are making an investment in themselves and they wanted them to um, not use it like you know not waste it not uh, ruin it unnecessarily because just because it is free and they wanted to also you know generate some revenue from it and because you know a lot of uh, the people were involved in that process the selling distributing they were able to give employment to those people because the lamp was not given away for free so you see the the lamp was uh, priced at 120 rupees after i mean they must have figured out what was the right price which people are actually going to pay before they priced it at 120 rupees so they were not like you know uh, giving it away for free it was for 120 uh, rupees and the rest of the amount 500 minus 120 the remaining um, Yeah, 380 rupees were actually covered in a split between the cost was split between the government and the philanthropists who covered that part of the cost. So that is how they actually subsidized it enough so that the cost was brought down, the price of the product was brought down to 120 rupees, and that became affordable for the people for whom it was. Okay, question number six. What factors were necessary to achieve if Seoul's um, solar lamp was to reach a million, millions of rural users? So I mean, you know, there were many things they were trying to achieve, but the main target was how many people they can reach, and they had the target of reaching a million. Initially, they had the target of reaching a million users, and then. Of course, they expanded it to. Once they exceeded that target, they decided to expand it to millions of users. So the re the reason why it was able to achieve that target was, you know, these factors. Um, so the answer is already on the on the screen. The affordability, availability, and repairability were extremely important because see, the thing is, durability was important. But even if the product is not that durable, like you find there's a fault after three months or five months, like maybe something doesn't work, maybe some some part uh, needs to be replaced or needs a little bit of repair. And the problem is that even if it kind of stops working after five months or four months or whatever, it can still be repaired. So the reason why it was successful was because it could always be repaired, and the reason it was easily repaired was because it was firstly locally manufactured so people knew how to repair it and secondly most of the materials were local so you could procure parts very easily and uh, thirdly like you know the accessibility like the places place where it was repaired was very close by so you could you had very easy access to um, you know the place where lamp could be repaired so that is Uh, more important, far more important than durability. Affordability was, of course, important because you know if it is too expensive, you make a very great lamp, but you sell it to them for five hundred rupees, they can't buy it. So they can't, you can't reach a million people with five hundred rupees. So affordability was important, and availability, of course, is the most a very obvious choice because if it's not available to a million people, how can a million people even buy it? It needs needs to be available to A lot more than a million people, so that at least a million can buy it, and then of course they expanded it to more than a million. So the first three are the correct answers, and they were the reason why they were successful in reaching billions of users. Okay, question number seven. With a standard circuit, what other products can be envisaged, according to Professor Chetan Sulanki? So in this, uh, what they made was only the reading light, which had like you know a very low volt, like a very low wattage, and uh, which had like you know a limited range. Like light would not spread to a very big area; it would spread to a very small area. So with that, 
uh, they made the whole lamp, but the, the kind of like that design, you know, sort of like a, a modular design or a standard circuit, what he calls it, you could make other uh, products also, especially for rural usage, which could be um, created in the same sort of a way. And the, the examples he gives are solar street lights. You can, of course, think of solar street lights in that to being designed in that kind of like a modular way and uh, being locally repaired and locally manufactured and distributed and solar irrigation now, this is the other thing which you know people can't do because they don't have enough um, you know the machine enough energy to use the machinery in the fields but if we can solve that problem with say a solar a solar panel which sort of gets integrated into the power circuit of the machinery then you can solve that problem because you have plenty of sunlight in most of these areas. So these are two examples he gives. And um, you can check if anybody has successfully launched these products. <clears throat> Question number eight, what is meant by production by masses according to Professor Chikan Sulanti? So when a options are when a company starts to produce, it's not product a product, it should be produce a product for the entire population, it is called production analysis. Second option is when small companies are outsourced by bigger companies to manufacture a product, it is called production by masses. Third option is when the population produces various commodities, then it is called production by masses. Fourth option is when the population uses a product for a company at a certain margin, it is called production by masses. Now, uh, I think the answer should be obvious. So we've been discussing it for a very long time. The third option is correct, but when the population produces, it should be produces, not produce. When the population produces various commodities, then it is called production. That is, uh, and there's very less um, thing to explain in it, because it is sort of just what the terminology they have used. Um, but that is the meaning he's using it in, it's a context he's using. Question number nine, how is the new solar lamp design evolved from the previous design in terms of power consumption? So the um, initial design, the previous designs were using like five watts of power, if you remember. And that is why, you know, people were using it in the fields and in, the, in cooking and in all sorts of other places, uh, you know, and the children were not getting it to use for reading in the, in the first place. So they felt like, you know, a lot of that five watts is not actually needed for reading and they did some calculations and they, um, they kind of figured out how much um, power, how much lumens do the students actually need for reading and in how much, you know, area, how much distance is that light going to be spread. So then they found out that they need uh, you know, I've forgotten the exact figure, but you should know the lumens which are needed for them to read. And for that much uh, lumens, you don't actually need five watts of power. You can make it work with just one watt. Just imagine it runs on just one watt of power. Most of the, you know, most of the appliances, most of the things we use in our daily usage, they use anything from 100 watt and above, right? Even a room heater is like, you know, it is at least 100 to 100 watts, right? And this particular reading light, it runs on just one watt of power. So that is the, uh, you know, the optimization we have achieved in the design process. And that is the reason why the lamp was so easily uh, achievable in a modular way because you know if the, if the photovoltaic cell becomes very big or if the photovoltaic cell circuitry becomes very complex then you can't localize it you can't do any of the many of the things which you uh, which you would see that they did in localizing the design the localization part became easy 
because they reduce the power consumption and hence they simplified the circuitry a lot um, to just one watt of power and a simple modular design for that kind of a design. And of course, there's other options. So they, it doesn't have any power wastage compared to the previous design. So in the previous design, a lot of the power was actually um, getting wasted. So last question, question number 10. Which among the following training tasks were given to the not so literate makers of the rural areas for the installation of the lamp? So uh, this should be sort of like a bit obvious. The people who had a little bit of you know better skills, better understanding of the circuitry and of how the thing works, they were asked to do the measurement of the circuit, the battery, and the solar panels because this is this kind of requires a little bit more knowledge, a little bit more understanding than just measuring. Um, you know, say like it says the plastic body. That was that's not correct. Because circuit measurements require you to know how to use, say, a multimeter. The battery measurements also, and similarly, it's solar panels. This is like the more technical part of the whole process. So, uh, with this, we have completed um, the previous week's assignment. Now, um, I'm just going to share, uh, you know, the practice questions which. I have from the previous years with you. So this is week three. This is week three stuff. Um, and uh, uh, again, in this assignment, you can see that the answers are actually already marked in the assignment. That is just how the file is. So this like, um, I, I think I have already uploaded this file. Just check if I haven't. But I think I should have already uploaded this file in that same shared folder. So I'll just give it a minute. Um, just, I'll, it'll be good. I may have to sort of stop the screen share in between to explain something. So just go and check in that shared folder if you can see this file, like if you can access this file and if you can it would be a good idea to open it on your own systems also so if i stop the screen share and i start explaining something you can you just have the file open so i'm just giving you a few minutes to go and check the file and download
Okay, so let's continue. Uh, so question number first, actually this file does not have numbers on the question. So you can just sort of number it yourself. I will just point it. This is question number one. Which industry was Bentley in system made for? So the answer is already there. So he's discussed uh, the whole process of manufacturing tires for the tire industry and how they tested the wind cleaning system for the tire industry. So this answer is kind of obvious. Question number two. In the case of um, digitally um, personalized jewelry. Oh, the case of digitally personalized jewelry, how did Sir Abish solve the problem? So he talks a lot about how he uses micro machining in all the different aspects of um, you know, the design. And the code, he makes a code with arrays of holes using micro machining. This is kind of there in the uh, in the second lecture. Um, the tools used for micro machining, this is a more factual technical thing. You can see that you know he actually gives the um, context of exactly how fine micro machining can be, and it is one fourth of a human hair. This is like a human, um, human hair, and one fourth of that is micro machining. Which of the following is not a type of additive micro machining? That was laser machining process. Then why was the five axis positioning system adopted instead of three axis positioning system? And this was basically to position the laser at the right angles, you know, normal to the vent hole, because all the other the other system was not exactly at right angle. And this, you know, the positioning the laser normal to the vent hole was kind of useful in in the whole manufacturing mm -hmm. process. Then this is the next part is from the last lecture. What was the advantage of an indigenously developed knee joint? And all of these are kind of important. Is the size is more suitable for Indian patients because you know the ones which are not indigenously uh, produced, they were sort of working with specs, you know, and the dimensions and the physique of people from outside India, and that was not really the most well suited for Indian people. And they also developed this extra functionality that it can bend uh, a lot more than ninety degrees. And they added the like slight twist movement to mimic natural knee-like movement. So all of these were actually the key features of the knee joint they developed in India. Uh, the knee prosthesis was designed to be, uh, I'm not going through all options because the first option is the correct one. It was a more modular kind of design. <laughs> Sorry. In which like, you know, it was because it was modular, you could pick and choose different parts which could be sort of, you know, combined as required in that particular case. Next is titanium is poor in constant wear, therefore the moving knee parts are made up of an alloy coil. This is kind of a factual question, so I'm just not much to explain. The cobalt chromium molybdenum alloy. So this was the alloy they used for the moving parts of the knee. So that there is less wear and tear on the, the moving parts of the prosthesis. And the weight, as you can see, for the weight of the mega prosthesis is one kg, which is, you know, which is sort of a reduction in the in the weight in the whole thing. Uh, what is used to fix the bone and the titanium stem? So they actually came up with a special kind of a cement where they used it and it improved the longevity as well as you know, the uh, the overall stability of the of the whole product. So I just went over it quickly because a lot of these questions were more factual and there was less um, conceptual stuff to explain. But I hope um, this is clear. This is, this is actually the sample question from the previous years. That is why I wanted to take it up. And uh, because this part itself is a bit technical, so the questions are also a little bit more on the technical side. So um, I guess this is there's no further questions. We can probably end the class here. We, if there are any other questions, you can ask me now. We can discuss it from week three or from week two. <coughs> oh. 
okay so then we can end the this class here and if you come up with any other questions we can take it to the next class okay thank you everyone thank you